to Saturday Night at the Movies, the podcast that celebrates classic cult and current films and the people that made them and many other aspects of pop culture. I'm your host, Steve Rubin. Our producer is Ben Shrewsbury, and our signature theme was composed by Greg Lerhoff. Here it's always Saturday night, and our mission is to chronicle film and pop cultural history one memory at a time. Tonight, we sound the trumpets, bang the drums, blow the bugles, and pound out the strokes for our Charlton Heston night, honoring one of the greatest actors of the widescreen. Joining me are two keen aficionados of Heston's amazing filmography, Professor John Trafton, whose latest book is Movie Made in Los Angeles. He also co-hosts two podcasts, Moving Histories and the movies, This Movie Saved My Life. Welcome, John. Steve, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And joining us is my good friend and fellow film historian, Avi Hearn, whom I originally met when we both were on the game show, The Joker's Wild. He did a lot better than I did. Welcome, Avi. Hi, Steve. Great to be here. So how could we not have a Charlton Heston night? I mean, I have to say that the, I've had so much enjoyment over the years from Charlton Heston movies, probably right up there with my Steve McQueen fascination. Um, let me ask you guys, let's start with John. John, when was the first time you feel that you discovered Charlton Heston? When I was four years old and I saw Ben-Hur. Ah. And it was, it was on one of those um, classic, uh, it was a MGM re-release uh, circa mid-80s that uh, came in those uh, dual VHS uh, packages. Oh, okay. Okay. So you didn't see it on the widescreen first. Uh, I did not see it on the widescreen first. I wish I could tell you that was the case. Uh, my father introduced me to this film because he had seen it on the big screen back when it came out uh, at the Seattle Cinerama, ah. like, which was practically invented for films like that. Oh, sure. What about you, Avi? You know, obviously, I've probably seen a number of his films on television as a kid, and they didn't really register that much. I mean, I don't think any movie really registered that much when I was a kid. And then in 1966, uh, when Paramount had re-released Ten Commandments, I remember seeing it in our local Paramount Theater in Peekskill, New York, in Westchester County, about 30 miles north of New York City. And obviously, seeing something on that scale for the first time in my life was um, memorable. And of course, you know, think, I mean, that that is, I mean, it's what, what Steve said, you know, uh, one of the greatest actors of the widescreen. I think that's a very good way of characterizing it because, you know, Heston made so many big movies. And so, and the movies are, you know, they are not just big in scale, but they're big in concept. And you need an actor who can stand out from all of that. And Heston was that actor. I mean, whether you are hugely fond of his acting or not, he held those movies together in a way that very few actors could. Well, it's it's funny because I was thinking about it today. Like, why didn't Paul Newman <laughs> do more costume movies? I think the I, Silver Chalice probably exactly yes, I think that, that. that. But some actors, like like I mentioned, Steve McQueen earlier, one of my favorite actors of all time. There's no way in hell that Steve McQueen would have put on a Roman toga. It just wouldn't have worked. But Heston seems to have been born to play historical figures. He um, he said, I, and one of the quotes from IMDb said that he broke his nose playing sports early on, and it said it gave him the profile of an eagle. <laughs> it seems to me that Heston was just born to be history's, uh, you know, guy. I mean, um, the first time I, 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 you know, I was trying to figure it out. Um, I was too young to see Ten Commandments in the theater. I probably saw him pretty much for the first time also in Ben-Hur, because that would have been a roadshow release in 59. I was seeing movies a lot in those days. Um, interesting actor in terms of the breadth of his career. Uh, born in Illinois. In fact, uh, I was reading uh, that he was born in a town called No Man's Land. Is that true? Well, his, his place of birth is generally given as Evanston. 
So no, yeah, but I think No Man's Land may have been a a suburb of Evanston. Um, I know that early on, he was. I think I, I know that one of his first movies was in Ju wasn't it Julia Julius Caesar Avi For David Bradley at at um, Northwestern yeah at Northwestern's kind of a, a low budget thing right yeah I mean it was, he really was a non professional I mean, he may have gotten some honor, kind of honorarium or something but uh, I met David Bradley at a book signing in, at, in Century City about you know two, twenty five or thirty years ago uh, Jimmy Stewart was signing a book of his poems. And David Bradley was one of the people online, so we chatted a little bit. <laughs> I um I have to say that in subsequently I started as more of his films appeared on television, I began to see them. I think one of my early favorites, long before the historical epics, was The Naked Jungle, <laughs> uh, which of course when you're when you're an elementary school student and you read Leningen versus the Ants, it's kind of a cool. Um, cool i guess it's a short story um and i was really into ants in those days because i had seen them the movie about the giant ants i love that desert uh which uh is one of my personal favorites and uh uh so i, I really enjoyed uh, the naked jungle although i have to say this seeing it as a youngster there was much too much romance in that movie his relationship with eleanor parker i was wondering when they would get to the ants already what what's actually kind of odd is, I mean, this was released by Paramount in 1954. And as sometimes happens, the studio makes two movies about the same thing in the same year. It, uh, it's the same movie. It's the, it, it and Elephant Walker, the same movie. Only it's ants instead of elephants. But otherwise, it's almost... I mean, Elephant Walker is also a romantic triangle. It's not, you know, the Dana Andrews character. But really, it's basically the same movie. And you have to ask yourself, what is it about the, the, the Paramount executives of that period? They didn't see that they were making two of the same movie. Well, they probably saved on, on ants because they're cheaper to handle than elephants. That's definitely true. So what we've done tonight for the listeners and viewers, because we are now a YouTube channel, so your faces will be seen all over the world on YouTube. Um... Thank you for combing your hair. <laughs> uh, we've divided up the movies. We're each going to talk about some of our favorites. And we're going to cover the breadth. Originally, I thought we would just talk about his historical films. And I have to tell you that uh, when I wrote my first book, Combat Films, I approached Mr. Heston to write a book called The Historical Films of Charlton Heston. And to my absolute delight, I got a letter from him from London saying he would like to cooperate. I knew about his diaries because Char Charlton Heston kept diaries on all of his film sets. And I thought they would be ideal source information for a good book on the behind the scenes films of Charlton Heston. So he invited me out to the set of Grey Lady Down shooting at Universal. And I think that was in 77. And I sat there with a manual typewriter and transcribed his Ben-Hur diary for right. eight and a half hours. <laughs> I literally spent the whole day typing into that little, and, and it was great. And he couldn't have been nicer. I remember him in his blue submariner's jumpsuit. And um, then um, Hollis Alpert, the head of the, uh, one of the heads of AFI, uh, convinced him to take his diary and just make a book called The Actor's Life. So my project went out the window and he published the actor's life, but uh, that was not the end of my seeing him, though. Well, you know the uh, what the parts about Ben Hur that are in the actor's life. Um, there's more material, and it was included in a an article in um, the issue of American Film Magazine that came out at the time of William Wyler's Life Achievement Award. So um, you know it's obviously not as extensive as what's in the in the book, but. It adds to adds depth to 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 what what Heston ultimately decided. Oh, sure, to sure. Show. So as I was saying, I was originally going to just do the historical films, but I felt that let's let's make this an all encompassing night. So so we'll start with John. John, why don't you talk about well, talk, which film would you like to discuss first? Oh goodness, um, you know it's not my pick. Uh, I believe it is Avi's pick. So and we've talked it's been mentioned quite a bit so far so i would say let's not beat around the bush let's uh dive into ben hur i'm passing the torch to avi All right, uh, well, i would like to say just really briefly which is i think talking about 
Charlton Heston in the historical film, I think, is a very important place to start because, I mean, he he didn't do exclusively historical films by any stretch of the imagination, but his work in historical cinema looms so large in our, our minds because he came about and all these films came about at a time when um, the film industry was trying to define itself in stark contrast to television and just fought, trying to find ways to survive, which they ultimately did, then collapsed, then were resurrected like a phoenix during the new Hollywood wave of the late 60s and 70s. But with films like Ben-Hur and uh, El Cid and Agony and the Ecstasy, some of my choices, it's really, really kind of no accident that he came about during a time when you have Panavision, Vistavision, and Cinemascope, and Cinerama being these technological innovations to compete with television. And they really, really took the epic that arose during Italian cinema and Hollywood during the 1910s and 1920s and gave it new, just a new expression for how we understand and relate to the past. The scholar Roland Bart described these films as being on the balcony of history. And, you know, I can't think of a better guide through this panorama than Charlton Heston in films like Ben-Hur. So I think that seems like a worthy place to start. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, so I relinquish, uh, you know, my first go to, to Avi and I say we talk about Ben-Hur. Uh, well, you know, Heston, Heston kind of divided the roles he had in his career in in, in two basic categories. And one, 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 there were there were those parts that he he played characters who wore clothing with pockets and those without pockets, meaning pockets <laughs> being contemporary roles and without pockets, the you know the the, the, the historical world. And very, you know, most actors are not comfortable in roles without pockets. They just don't fit into a period idiom. And Heston, I think, was just the opposite. He was very comfortable in those. He fit in very, very well. You you, you bought him immediately as being part of that world. But he seemed a bit uncomfortable in contemporary roles. Uh, he just never, to me, he never quite seemed right. I mean, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're watching a film of him, his when he's doing a contemporary role, you're kind of wishing you were watching him doing something no, it's it's so true. It's just the same thing we say about Paul Newman putting on a toga or Steve McQueen. So if you were talking to a classroom, Avi, of students who had never seen Ben-Hur, what would you tell them was a good reason for seeing Ben-Hur? It's, it's, it, you, could, you can argue that it's the first epic. Not uh, Alec, um, um, Eisenstein's Alexander Nevsky, not, notwithstanding. It may be the first epic that was ever truly done right, um, and it's also it, it's it, it it's a it's a quantum leap in terms of the sophistication of the epic. Uh, it, it is vastly beyond what DeMille did with the Ten Commandments. Um, it's it, it's you know, it still it still bridges that and epics to come: Spartacus, Lawrence of Arabia. Where they got more sophisticated, but without Ben Hur, those films I don't think would have been what they were. Um, and there's a story that Nicholas Roja tells, who scored who scored uh, Ben Hur and El Cid. El Cid. He was sitting with his friend one day. Uh, one day he was sitting with his friend uh, Sam Zimbalist, who had produced Cool Vadis and he produced, he was producing Ben Hur. And he, Zimbalist said it was, it was he was just overcome with happiness. He said, we, we we signed William Wyler to direct Ben Hur. Uh, which was a huge coup because no director of Wilder's stature had ever directed a film like that before. And Roja said, well, you, you know what that means, uh, Sam, that now this is no longer a Sam Zimbalist production. It's a William Wilder production. And all the major creative decisions are going to be made by him and not by you. Sam Zimbalist said, it doesn't matter. I don't care. As long as you make a great movie. And of course, they did. And Wilder brought a level of you know, his, his, his European, uh, his Europeanness, the sophistication that that, that 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 provided, and just his his track record as, as a director who whose career is virtually an unbroken string of string of masterpieces. 
Um, and so again, it's, it's, it's Ben Hur was the first epic to be done right. I mean, other epics you can cr criticize on one one level or another, but there's very little about Ben Hur you can cr criticize. It's just a film that's done so well on every level. And I think one of the most expensive movies ever made in Hollywood up to that time, I believe. It was. I mean, it was a little, slightly more expensive than Ten Commandments three years right. later. Right. Um, John, um, tell me, tell us a little bit about Heston's performance. Who is he playing? What kind of character is he? Well, he pay, plays uh, the titular uh, Judah Ben Hur, uh, who is um, he is a. Uh, Judean who has had a long time friendship with uh, a, a Roman centurion, Roman general named uh, Messala, and he is falsely uh, accused of uh, murdering a uh, Roman officer and is uh, sent to uh, the Gaulies and in a way that... Um, really foreshadows the sort of revenge stories that uh, films like Gladiator and the forthcoming Gladiator 2 would tell. This sort of sets off a series of emotions of uh, the uh, the slave who would uh, come back for revenge, you know, not just simply for his, uh, for his people, but uh, on a personal level, uh, culminating in, of course, the epic chariot race, uh, filmed at the uh, iconic Roman studio Chinichita or Studio City. And, and we should mention that it actually is a bit of a remake because they had done a silent version of Ben-Hur with also a quite amazing chariot race. And I... also based on a stage play that uh, during yeah. the uh, 1880s, which would feature um, actual horses on stage on running treadmill. around a treadmill essentially that was being controlled uh under the uh stage with a circular panorama painting that would be just whipping around making you know putting audiences even back then in this immersive experience i you know, i personally don't consider a a sound version of something that was earlier a silent version to truly be a remake it's it's a new adaptation new adaptation of, now the um the work. um novel wall wallace last name is wallace what was his first lou name? wallace lou wallace I, I i later discovered was a civil war general and later yes. governor of indiana Another governor of Indiana. The thing about Ben Hur, since it was the first movie I saw pretty much on the roadshow type of presentation, and this will be interesting to you, John, is when you walked into that theater, and I may have seen it at the Carthay Circle, I, I, which is an old movie palace in L.A., uh, there was such grandeur to the place, and the way that it, Roja's music, the way it's introduced in the overture just trumpets this movie, that you're in, in for something very special. And I think you're absolutely right, John. This was a terrific antithesis to what television was offering. This was widescreen, go to the movies, entertainment. I think the producers of Gladiator Part Two are hoping to kind of uh, get theatrical audiences to come to that movie in droves, and I'm hoping it's going to be a big hit. Well, I'd like to add what John said. Um, you know, Ben Hur is very much a revenge story, but it's a revenge story that comes around to being a redemption story. And um, in in Heston's diaries, he wrote of uh, discussing it with Weiler. And Weiler said that Judah Ben Hur at the beginning has to be an uncommitted man, apolitical, who was basically forced into doing what he does. It's it's not something that that is natural for him, which makes it even harder for him to do because it's something that is which is totally unfamiliar. And that's part of the the, the character's journey through the story. And ultimately, and, and it's 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 encapsulated by uh, Esther's line, where she tells him that his hatred is turning him to stone, and uh, it's as though you had become a Sala. He is becoming the very thing he set out to destroy, and it's destroying him. And now, now we know that's where the redemption comes in. We know uh, that William Wyler was a. a, a I, I don't think he was uh, considered a tyrant on the set. Uh, but certainly fairly commanding on the set, but known for multiple takes. And I think one of the stories you hear, and we have an image of uh, of uh, Judah ben Hare on the galley. Um, by the way, I often wondered about galley, uh, galley slaves. 
Were, were there bathroom breaks? Did they get a chance to relieve themselves? Because they're chained to the oar. Anyway. Well, you can say in the film they do depict it. I mean, they are rotated in and out. Yes, and they are rotated. What's, what's interesting, though, is in the novel, uh, Ben Hur makes a request of his captors. He says, um, "Can you like move me from like the port side of the ship, and, like every, like every every other day or whatever, the port side of the ship to the starboard and back again?" Because if, I, if, if we keep rowing on the same side, bent over the same way, eventually we're going to be twisted in that direction permanently and we'll never be able, we can't row. So, that, so they, and they actually do accommodate him. No, that's interesting. It's a little different than the uh, scene in uh, The Three Stooges Meet Hercules, where Skyler, uh, I don't know if you know the film, John, but they do a, a spoof of Ben Hur. And <laughs> that Skyler is so strong that he's rowing one side of the boat. And about 60 slaves are rowing the other side. It's actually pretty funny, but nothing to do with this. But anyway, uh, the rumor has it that in the rowing scenes uh, that Weiler was very demanding. What can you shed um, light on that, Avi? Well, I don't, I don't know about, you know, so much of that scene is the music. It's, it's Roger's music that, that makes that scene. Just, just, yeah, and it, in many ways, it reminds me of uh, the music cue for um, the Wheel of Pain, where Schwarzenegger is going around in a circle when he's, he's like growing up, you know, he's chained to this thing in, in Conan the Barbarian. Oh, and, okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah. And Basil Polidorus's music had to do the same thing Rose's music in, in Ben Hur for the Rowing of the Galaxy Slaves did, is it had to depict tedium without the music itself being tedious. Well, for, uh, forgive my musical ability, but I will do the da dum, da da dum, da da dum. Da, da, da. It, it is it is it is quite the uh, the beating of the stroke since my introduction at the beginning um no no it's such a powerful scene and uh by the way in 1970 i went to the mgm auction uh where they were auctioning off all of the uh back lot props and sitting outside the sound stage were all the galleys used in the min the miniature galleys used in ben-hur they were a little bit outside my price range. Well, a little outside of where you'd be able to store them anyway. I mean, no, it's kind of hard to keep a galley in uh, in an apartment, let alone, uh, you know, take it home in your car. Uh, John, do you have a favorite scene in the movie? Um, I mean, apart from the obvious, which is uh, the chariot race scene, I love all the moments with um, uh, Ilderim and... Uh, all the tra the training sequences. Oh, you're you know, talking about a, the Hugh Griffith character. Yeah, just kind of a almost that forerunner to like the Rocky Eye of the Tiger moments. Just uh, you know, like because he he understands he understands Ben Hur and he understands his desire for revenge, and he he knows that it's not going to be just as he can't just waltz into you know, Rome and confront Masala head on. It's like, I'm going to help you get what you want. And as someone who profits from chariot races, you're going to help get me what I want. So the dynamic between the two of those and just sort of the training sequences where he's introduced to the horses and everything, that whole, that whole segment of the film, I just absolutely love. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, think about it, what's interesting is I hadn't thought about it before. Is that Ilderim, is a, a religious man in a way that Ben Hur is not. Ben Hur is largely secular, and uh, and that Ilderim's desire to take it to the man, which is Rome, it seems more out of out of his his belief in a, in a single God, whereas whereas Ben Hur is, it's personal. It's funny because uh, I think in these kinds of films, often the success of the film is often due to how good the villain is, and I think Stephen Boyd is a terrific masala. I agree. That, that very same year, showing a bit of the range of the actor, he's in the uh, very soapy movie, The uh, the Best of Everything, uh, where he plays a publishing executive who falls in love with Hope Lang. Very different kind of role. But uh, this movie, the power of Roja's score is is just terrific. And, and of course, uh, Mr. Heston's performance got him the Best Actor Oscar that year. Uh, just a wonderful, a wonderful movie. Uh, John, why don't we take on one of yours? Uh, what what uh, film would you like to discuss next? Um, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to shift here from 
historical epic to a still a period drama, uh, but based on a novel. And it's uh, an adaptation of uh, Jack London's novel, Call of the Wild. Uh, and for the listeners uh, who have, who are familiar with the novel, uh, Charlton Heston plays a character named Jack Thornton. And in the novel, who essentially becomes the story centers around Buck the dog, who's kidnapped from his idyllic life in Northern California and is sent to, uh, up to the gold fields of Alaska to be a sled dog. Uh, he is passed on from one cruel master to another cruel master until finally he finds someone who saves his life and is, is his best friend for the red remainder of the novel. Uh, that's the character of John Thornton. In this adaptation, John Thornton is Buck's master from the get-go, and then the two lose each other, and then he gets bounced around from you know, cool master, cool master, and the two are reunited again. So this sort of shifting and rearranging of uh, the characters is uh, kind of interesting and plays to this persona that uh, Charlton Heston had already developed for himself. It's like you can kind of almost see this potentially being a role that uh, Clint Eastwood could have theoretically played had the film been adapted in the 80s instead of 1971. Gotcha, gotcha. The film that I am going to talk about is... Oh, can I add something for a moment? Of it, course. Um, you, I mentioned that film with, with Steve when we were talking on the phone the other day. I said, you know, when we talk about uh, any actor's best films, you have to uh, also address what you might think is his worst film. And um, uh, maybe we're John and I like part company here, but I think it is very likely the worst, Caldwell is very likely the worst film that Tesla ever made. <laughs> Uh, I think all right, now, 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 I, I wouldn't disagree with you. On okay, that. I, I, I mean, I well, I mean, I would slightly in that I don't think it's his worst film, but or his worst performance, but it's definitely not his best. I'm not even talking about his performance, just the movie uh, as it is. I mean, you know, he, I, he's, he's fine within the you know, in terms of what the movie allows him to do, but um, it's just a badly made movie with, with too little money and and just it, lo it looks quick and cheap and 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 like a movie that that they say oh well let, let's just pull out a book off the shelf let's make a movie of it and let's get charles Heston to do it well i i but, i'll have to stay totally neutral here because i've never seen okay. it so i yeah. i can't offer an opinion i haven't seen it it, it, it used to be on television in new york all the time and, and now it's disappeared uh, well, well, it, what i understand heston was not fond of it either sure I mean, Av and Avi's right about that. I mean, it looks like, and probably was, uh, conceived as a made-for-television film. And it, it does have that appeal to it. And yeah, I agree. Jack London novels are a lot more difficult to uh, adapt than a lot of people think. A lot of people think, you know, oh, you're just going to go on in a, uh, a an Alaska, you know, Klondike adventure story. And it's, there's way, it's so dense with his philosophy on life and his sort of like almost proto existentialism that, uh, you know, that that's very difficult to adapt into a film for. It was like an Italian film called Martin Eden not too long ago that uh, was an adaptation that I felt was like really the only Jack London film that Jack London adaptation that kind of came close to capturing any of that. I mean, in a wider sense, I mean, you know, it's like people making a movie need to know what the movie's really about. It's not about the contrivances and convolutions and, and conceits of plot. I mean, they're, you know, the, the the writer wrote it for other reasons. And if you don't address that, you don't see what that that's your, what your movie is really about. You're not going to make, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be a faithful adaptation. It's, it's, it's going to make it kind of pointless. I'm going to jump back in time to one of his earlier films, uh, which is also done for Cecil B. DeMille, which was The Greatest Show on Earth. Now, this is not a great movie, although it did win the best picture that year, beating out to films like The Bad and the Beautiful and High Noon, uh, uh, which is kind of crazy. But I have to say this, you know, Charlton Heston shows off his commanding presence as Brad Braden, the manager of this, this Barnum and Bailey circus. And he, in every scene he's in, he doesn't lose the focus of being the guy in charge. 
And when he take when he punches out John Kellogg, who's you know the gambler, corrupt gambler, it's it's a one of the great punches in in uh, in Hollywood history. And I love his relationship with um, uh, with the blonde actress whose name is Betty Hutton. Betty Hutton. Thank you, thank you. Have, have you seen uh, the Greatest Show on Earth, John? Yes, absolutely. It's a fun movie, of course. And Jimmy Stewart plays the whole movie in the clown makeup, which I thought was interesting. Avi and I did some research uh, on this movie because we were planning a movie at Showtime on uh, the battle between Cecil B. DeMille and Joe Mankiewicz during the Blacklist era. And uh, we learned a little bit about um, the prep for The Greatest Show on Earth. And we learned that Jimmy Stewart always wanted to play a clown, and it was kind of a fun thing for him. But Heston was terrific. The only time we see the only time we see uh, Stewart without the makeup is when Henry Wilcoxon's policeman is showing around a photograph of Stewart when he was, you know, still the doctor who is who's now being sought for her. For, was, for... Did Henry Wilcoxon play the the policeman? Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't realize that. Well, uh, Avi, why don't you pick a pest and picture you'd like to talk about? Well, let, let, let's say I'm great show on Earth for a moment. Um, you know, I think the film's great value is that it is the greatest photographic record of what the circus was under canvas during its heyday. Because when I saw, I, I went to the, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum Valley Circus with a bunch of my classmates when I was in college. We saw it in Madison Square Garden where you're like in the rafters, you're looking down at, you know, it's, it's a, everything's a million miles away. And it reminded me of when I went to a circus uh, as a teenager, it was the Clyde Beatty Cold Brothers Circus, it's like in a big field someplace in Connecticut. And it, even though the acts, uh, the Ringling Brothers, uh, I'm sure, were much better, it didn't. It was. It didn't have the same impact because you need to be under a tent, and you have to have. It brings out the sense of the, of the nomad in all of us. And Saw, sawdust, baby, sawdust. Exactly. Sawdust. Yeah, 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 as as, as Heston, as, as somebody on the movie says, you know, you've got sawdust in your veins. That's sawdust um, in your veins. But but it's you know the the, the, the so the film is, is is hugely important in that regard. I mean, I you know that footage is going to be there forever. People can study it because the circus doesn't, that circus doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but it's. It's you know the film is 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 as melodramatic as a movie can get. I mean it, it is kind of like the apotheosis of melodrama. There's nothing there's nothing deep about the greatest show on earth. It's just you know it is what well, it, it, it. Apparently, it inspired Steven Spielberg as a kid when he saw that, especially the train wreck. It's yeah, the train wreck. Yeah, but definitely one of the <laughs> angel. There you go, angel. Um, I am going to jump into one of my favorites which is 55 Days at Peking. Now, this was, another, this was four years after Ben-Hur and another roadshow, big, big screen, widescreen epic. And once again, Heston is cast in a perfect role for him. He plays Major, uh, Major Matt Lewis, who's a U.S. Army, uh, I guess he's an infantry officer, assigned to patrol the, as he says it, the, the rice paddies of China. And then gets caught up in the Boxer Rebellion siege of Peking. Uh, I, I, in, in, it's interesting that um, this movie didn't was not a happy production at all. Apparently, Ava Gardner, God rest her soul, arrived uh, intoxicated, uh, gave a lot of trouble to the production, demanding rewrites. Uh, but it's funny how when actors get on camera, they're all of a sudden perfect. You know, with that necklace of hers wandering around. It's funny, I'm, as a kid, I never liked romantic elements of these epic movies. I said, forget about the romance array. Let's get on with the battle. I want to see the Siege of Peking. I felt the same way that same year Ben-Hur was released by the Never So Few movie with Frank Sinatra and Richard Johnson about the Kachin guerrillas in Burma during World War II, but somehow they wedged Gina Lola Brigida into the story, and I got to deal with all this romance stuff again. Well, the travails with the 55 Days actually began when Samuel Bronston offered Heston the lead in Fall of the Roman Empire. He said it had already been half built, and Heston didn't want to do it, but he said, I will do 55 Days. So they tore down the the, the sets for, for, for of Rome, and they built... Peking over the skeletons that had been built for Rome, and 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 so that's how Heston came to do it. And uh, but they had more travails in the film because 
Um, there were problems with Nicholas Ray. He had never done anything on that scale before, and Heston just didn't think he really had command of the company. And ultimately, uh, and it's still kind of in dispute, uh, Ray may have suffered a, 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 uh, a nervous breakdown during the making of the film. And if you watch the film, he plays the American ambassador in the wheelchair, and it may have been on after your. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Me, yeah. I also read that uh, there were no, there not, there were not enough Chinese extras outside Madrid. So they recruited Chinese from all over Europe, yes. forcing many Chinese restaurants to close for the summer because their whole staff was sent to Spain. That's the story. Um, but so anyway, Heston Heston suggested to Bronston what they what they need to do is shoot two units, day unit and night unit. And Guy Green, the cinematographer, shot one, and Heston directed a lot of the other one. Oh. It's a very, it's a when it does get physical and when it gets away from Ava Gardner and her necklace. It is a very good physical action movie with a lot of realistic battle sequences. John, what do you remember about the movie? I actually haven't seen this film. Oh, wow. Well, you are so, in for a treat. Yeah, it, it sounds like it. It's a gorgeous movie. I mean, I think it's maligned. I think it tells the story perfectly well. The story is perfectly serviceable. I mean, it's, again, it's not a terribly deep movie, but it's it's just, you know, it's it, it, it has a wonderful sense of time and place. And considering right. that it's China as you know built in madrid of all places uh, you know <laughs> well, it starts out with the narrative line peking china the summer of 1900 the rains are late millions of chinese are starving and it's just a great great opening narration track i should have that you know, when you see the film uh, it has uh, the main title is a series of watercolors by the uh, 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 chinese american artist don kingman don kingman and about five or six years ago, Steve called me one day and he said, um, they're having a, an estate sale at the Heston House. You want to come? We both went over there. And among the things I bought there, I didn't buy much, but it was, it was a print of, of a uh, operations sale. It was, it was a license an operation sale in New York Harbor in 1986. And... Um, it was and, and I, I just it was Don by Don Kingman and I, I so I, I bought it like twenty dollars and and when it came time to to frame it I took a better look at it and not only is it signed by Kingman but it's inscribed to Lydia and Chuck uh, like Happy Birthday whatever it is Happy Anniversary whatever from from Don Don so it's signed twice by Don Kingman and I I can't, can't tell you how delighted I was to find this actual signed oh, that's by Don Kingman because I've loved his work ever since I saw Fifty Five Days so it's been. John, I'm going to put up a still of El Cid, and I know this is one of your favorites. Uh, tell sure. us, tell us why you're a fan of El Cid. Um, I'm a fan of El Cid just because I feel that like it came, yeah. You know, for one, I love Anthony Mann. I think Anthony Mann is sort of one of those unsung great directors from throughout the 1950s and early 1960s, uh, and fantastic performances by uh, Charlton Heston in the title role and Sophia Loren. And this was really kind of at a time when uh, tra transnational cinema was really kind of becoming part and parcel of the ep historical epic form. And although this was really kind of uh, just a few years before um there was the um, collapse of the epic form under the weight of uh, the ill-fated Cleopatra at 20th Century Fox Studios. Uh, this was a film that, you know, I think really kind of should have been like the lasting impression in people's minds of what the epic film uh, form can do. It, again, talking about signaling Ridley Scott, it signaled a lot of what Ridley Scott would eventually do in films like kingdom of heaven later on uh and probably out of all of the epic films of uh from uh this period whether it be ivanhoe or uh or ben-hur or spartacus uh, I've, I've always felt that this film and this is maybe to anthony mann's credit has the most painterly images well isn't it true also you mentioned anthony mann a, a wonderful director but i heard this was a troubled production because he, he suffered a heart attack. Yes. Uh, and I think as I read, and maybe I'm wrong, that a lot of the movie was directed by Andrew Martin, uh, who was a prominent second unit and uh, 
lesser director. Yes, that, I mean that that is true, and it was. Um, and, and you can kind of feel like you know it's hard, difficult to tell where the influence of one ends and the other one begins. Sure, sure, it's a very you know, point. Um, Avi, what do you think of El Cid? Well, you know, Heston in his diaries wrote um, that if Anthony Mann and William Wilder had traded films and Wilder had directed Ill, if, if Mann had directed Ben Hur, it would not be much less than it is. But if Wilder had directed El Cid, it could have been the greatest epic film of all time. I agree probably with that. True. Excuse me? It's probably true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, thank you. I mean, it, it, that I think that that Ben Hur would be a lot less if, 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 than it is if, if Man had directed it. But the, the problem is, you know, if you, if you look at the production history of Ben Hur, uh, the MGM executives were perfectly happy with the script that Carl Thunberg had handed in. Uh, they just wanted to go to production with that script right away. And Will Wilder was just not happy with it. And he brought in a whole series of writers, including Gord Vidal and S.N. Berman, and finally brought in Christopher Fry to re basically rewrite, rewrite the dialogue. And they, that allowed Ben Hur to give a sense of real people saying and doing real things within a period of which is one of the great triumphs of Ben Hur. That's what other, other epics that preceded it simply were not able to achieve. And El Cid doesn't quite rise to that level. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I was once at a. Um, I went to a, a talk at the Academy with um, Philip Dunn, who had written the script of uh, How Green Was My Valley. Now there's a, a Philip Dunn lecture series named after him. This was the first uh, first lecture in that series given by him. And he said that you know, Wilder was the original director on How Green Was My Valley. And he said that Wilder was just worked with writers the same way he did with actors. He would just keep telling you, you can do better, you can do better, you can do better. And it took so long that Wilder the, the terms of his loan out from Sam Goldwyn expired and Goldwyn wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, renew it. So Daryl Zanuck had to ask John Ford to step in and direct the film. And Dunn said, but because of Wilder, it's the great, best script he ever wrote. And I think that the script in El Cid, I don't think Wilder ever would have gone into production with that script either. It's a good script, but it's not as good as it could have been. And I don't think the performances are quite where, where Wilder would have gotten them. Again, having that sense of real people saying real things to each other within a period of time. I mean, ben, it's there's, there's a slight, there's a lot of dead space in between in between line readings in that film. Uh, somewhere the film is somewhere between the performances in Ten, of Ten Commandments and El Cid and Ben Hur. It, it doesn't rise again. It doesn't quite rise to the level. Of it. But El Cid is a better story than Ben Hur, and it's, of course, it's real. I mean, it's a true story. And uh, the, the character is deeper, and there there's so much more that, that could have been plumbed and wasn't. What's also interesting is that you have it actually shot in Spain, just like uh -huh. the, just like the previous film we discussed, which had both films had been made during the 1940s, they would have been shot both of them in Mark. in <laughs> Calabas in Calabasas. Uh, you know, same thing. You know, same thing with you know how green was my valley. You know, there's a, it's set in Wales and uh, on the, yeah. yeah, 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 in Calabasas. And also at the time, Paramount Pictures would have as part of their promotional material, quite proudly, a map of California with uh, places on the map shown of like other places they could stand into. And Wales is uh, Rancho Palos Verdes <laughs> and Spain is uh, Santa Barbara. Which of course you can kind of pass. You can kind of pass off uh, the Fox Ranch uh, as Wales in black and white. You wouldn't have worked in color. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the valley actually had to be green. I mean, that just wouldn't have wouldn't have happened. Now, in El Cid, um, Mr. Heston plays a valiant Spanish knight. In the Warlord in 1960, let's see, 67, he plays a French knight, Chrisagon de la Cruz. Now. This is one of my favorite Heston movies. I, I think that um, it's based on a, I guess, on a play called The Lovers. By Leslie Stevens. By Leslie Stevens. For those of you who haven't heard of it, he plays a knight who arrives with a small contingent of men to take over a small, um, I don't call it, what do you call it? You don't call it a fort, Avi. You call it a... Uh, well, it was, you know, it was... 
it kind of uh, it's hard to describe because it's just a tower because you know, it's just a tower universal didn't want to build like a whole castle, castle so, <laughs> so he, get, he gets one tower and they have a right that he ends up spending some time with the locals who are all subscribers to a kind of pagan religion and they have there's this um there's this ritual that if a local person is getting married the uh, royal in charge of the area has the right of the first night. So basically, and that would never work today, uh, although I'm well, sure politicians who would like that. That's called droit de seigneur, and then it's right. very common in, you know, in, in, uh, in feudal societies, I and mean, that, that right, was right. a real thing. Um, but and, and, it's a film that doesn't quite know what it wants to be, though. I mean, does, does it go, is, is it a, a, an action movie? Is it a, a battle movie? Is it, uh, the, you know, this mystical movie with the with the villagers what, what's it, in heston's diaries he wrote that uh franklin Schaffner's original cut of the film was about two and a half hours oh universal didn't want to release it at that length but i sure would love to see it you know boy, boy, me too. that the, the Schaffner had, had and then and, and and i i don't who wrote the, i don't remember if stevens did the adaptation himself but you know the film that was envisioned rather than the film we ultimately got the um you know, we talk a lot about Roja and his contributions to films like El Cid and Ben Hur. Jerome Moras's score for The Warlord is a terrific score. Yes. Uh, definitely lends lends a great deal of uh, atmosphere uh, to it. And uh, and our, your old friend Henry Wilcoxon <laughs> comes back as a as an elderly Viking, and uh, that's kind a of Frisian. Fun. I'm sorry, a Frisian, a Frisian, exactly, a Frisian. Yeah. Now, John, uh, you selected The Agony and the Ecstasy as one of your favorites. Tell us a bit why you chose this movie. Because the story is just so fantastic, and I think few people really understand the nitty-gritty of it. And uh, also, just I, I'm hoping that our discussion of this film is a vehicle to steer your uh, audience towards reading the actual Irvin Stone novel which is just a phenomenal read from start to finish. But here we have, uh, essentially, it's the story of the painting of uh, the Sistine Chapel with uh, uh, Charlton Heston as uh, Michelangelo and Rex Harrison. Yes, that Rex Harrison from My Fair Lady uh, as the Pope. And this, and just the way that this story captures... Um, art movements and as a biopic it's just sort of the genre that uh, is often referred to as a fiction that dare not speak its name it works very well at capturing really the essence of who he was and making the past be this sort of strange and exotic place while using it at the same time to as a mirror for what our own inner life is, what our own struggles are. You know, we all have projects and labors of love that uh, we've gone through at various periods of our lives that we can relate to. And that feeling, that struggle, the titular agony, and then the titular ecstasy is something we all can relate to. And it's just sort of the way it's written on his face throughout the, uh, Don Heston's face throughout the whole performance, that just stays with me. And... We should mention, we should mention that we should right. mention that he's playing Michelangelo, of course, for the people who haven't seen it. The 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 task of painting that ceiling is quite um is quite a task. I, I've been to the Sistine Chapel a few times and it's 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 very well preserved. Avi, do you have thoughts on the film? Yeah, I do. I mean, first of all, you know, the film had a, a prologue, which is about 15 minutes, and it's a tour of the Vatican and the artworks, and not, not all of them by by Michelangelo, but mainly. And it's called The Artist Who Did Not Want to Paint. And that really sets the tone for the whole movie because this is about a sculptor who was being forced to paint. And it's something he didn't want to do. And he didn't feel he was a good painter. And it's just not how he wanted to like to express himself. And he ended up painting something that has been, you know, has inspired awe. So an overused word these days, but it's, it, you know, in, in, in for centuries. But the thing is that I, I'm sure that Irving Stone didn't think about this when he wrote his novel. He wrote his book. But the movie is a metaphor for Hollywood. This is what you, this is what you get when you have artists 
who are employed, who have to have patrons in order to, to indulge in their art. And what the patron wants and what the artist want may be two totally different things. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's where the conflict comes in. It is interesting that uh, I read that uh, when Cecil B. DeMille was casting Ten Commandments, I think he chose uh, Heston because Heston looked like the figure in Michelangelo's Moses. Uh -huh. I mean, there's there's still there are publicity photos of Heston. I mean, obviously the Vatican gave them permission for him to climb up on the, on the statue. <laughs> oh, but you know, it's like you think they would do that now? Probably not. Probably not. Um, but but. Demille went through a whole strange um, um, thought process in terms of casting, because at first he thought of casting his old buddy, William Boyd, who was better known as Hopalong Cassidy. As, as, <laughs> as, as Moses? Moses? Yeah, I don't remember if he actually be talked out of it, but but it was something he was thinking about. You know, that Boyd looked like the old Moses, though there's no way he could have played the young Moses. Um, you know, fortunately, what, what, what I don't know who else, ever else might have been on the short list, but uh, uh, he, he finally came around to Heston. And Heston tells the story in, in his in his in his diaries that he was uh, at Paramount. This is early on. In fact, it was it was before Greatest Show on Earth. He had just done um, his first film, Dark City. And he was just standing around, like on a, on a corner there in the studio, and 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 Demille was driving past. At the end of the day, and Demille waved to him, and Demille—I mean, Heston waved to Demille, and Demille looked around and just thought about him, and and he just, and like the next day, he asked uh, one of his secretaries, uh, "Who was that young man?" And he was told, and so he, he screened Dark City, and that one thing led to another, and ultimately, he, he led, led to him casting him on Greatest Show on Earth. Well, oh, Greatest Show on Earth had had, uh, according to Kirk Douglas, Douglas had been the original choice for Brad Braden. And that uh, Douglas's uh, agent asked for more money than he no longer to pay, and uh, so ultimately, you know, uh, and anything that bills itself as Charlton Heston Night has to include a film that more contemporary audiences know about, which is, of course, Planet of the Apes. Who wants to talk about Planet of the Apes? Okay, I'll start. It, it, it goes. It goes to the same what I said about again having big concepts that need a big actor to command your attention. Uh, Planet of the Apes is a big movie, uh, and you know, so, and, and you need look no farther than the um, uh, uh, Tim Burton film Planet of the Apes, where uh, it became becomes very clear very early on again a, a big a big concept that uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg is not that actor, and you know he's he's lost among that. I mean, he's, he's, he's Although Burton's film, to be fair, Burton's film is, is less Planet of the Apes than it is an uncredited remake of Spartacus. It's yeah, I also good. thought they made a, a tactical blunder by allowing all of the human beings to speak, making uh, Wahlberg's character no different than anybody else. I thought one of the cool things about the Heston picture is he lands on this planet and humans are mute. So uh, it leads you to that wonderful moment when he's captured and all of us and he says, get your... What does he say? Get your damn your stinking paws off my get, get your take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Or damn dirty <laughs> human when Heston is, is, is the uh, is the gorilla. There, there you go. There you go. John, what do you think? This is a film that um I, I think is the end of one era and the beginning of another, both in terms of his performance and the special effects. You know, it's like I urge anyone to go out in the Los Angeles area, just go out to Point Doom, and uh, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about in Malibu, and just uh, where you witness that uh, uh, that final Statue of Liberty moment in the film. Uh, Heston's performance in this, yeah, you're right. I mean, you need a big movie to contain him. You know, just like you know, almost like what they would be say about De Niro during the '80s, and yeah, this and. I have really haven't ventured that far into like any of these Planet of the Apes remakes because it just doesn't it, it, it they're big in a physical sense, but they just do not feel to capture the emotional richness that Heston brings to this role. Oh, sure. And it was nice to see him in, you know, uh, after all those togas and knights outfits, it's nice to see him playing a modern astronaut. 
although he spends most of the movie in rags because he's been captured. Um, so I, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I remember seeing this in LA in first run. And when they show the apes on horseback during the first roundup of the humans, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe they'd created an ape. And of course, this is, this is, um, the John Chambers, I think did the, yeah, John Chambers. John Chambers artistry, of course, now, now they have digital apes that look exactly as they should be, but different type of artistry. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to throw up a, a picture of a movie that Avi wanted to talk about because whereas we talked about Call of the White being one of his lesser efforts although with a good performance Avi's a big fan of a movie called Will Penny and Avi tell us why you think this movie is Heston's best well it's it's a quiet movie um in, in many ways it, 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 I, something, it, it reflects something I, I, that I wanted to explain on what John just said about uh, Planet of the Apes in that it's, I think it, it forms a line of demarcation uh, where Heston's career started to decline. I think at that point, he was less in demand for a, a leading man role. He was aging out of, of, of leading man roles. And Will Penny, I mean, the, the, the story of Will Penny is, is that um, Tom Grimes, who had basically worked in television, had gotten the script of Heston, and Heston loved it. And Heston wanted to give it to William Wyler to direct. And Grice said, no, the script is not for sale unless I direct. And it kind of mirrors what happened years later with, with uh, Sylvester Stallone and his script for Rocky, where he said he wouldn't, he wouldn't sell it unless he uh, starred in the movie. And, um, but, you know, the thing about, one, of the, one of the things I love about Will Penny is that the first 15 minutes or so may be the most accurate depiction of what it was actually like to be a cowboy that has ever been put on film. It's cold, it's dusty, you sleep on hard ground, you're, you're, you're stealing biscuits from the chuck wagon. Uh, you're not surrounded by, you're surrounded by people you get along with if you're lucky, but they're not friends. Uh, you're, you're not, um, there's nothing to look forward to. You just go out and you, do, you work on this cattle trail and then when it's over, you hope you can get another job. And later in the film, uh, where he points out to the, um, uh, I always forget her name, uh, Joan, uh, Joan Hatchett. Hatchett character, uh, where you know, he says, like, I'm damn near 50 years old. And, you know, he knows that when his working days are over, there are no pensions, there are no, uh, uh, there's no social security. I mean, he might as well just crawl under a safe brush and die because he's not going to have any money to do anything. He won't be able to live. And that's what it was for all of you. You know, the, our, the, our, 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 um, image of a cowboy is was was established by Western writers like Zane Gray and Owen Wister, and then taken up and amplified by Hollywood. But all that stuff, you know, gunslingers sitting around saloons playing cards and drinking and going out and shooting people in the street. I mean, that's not what the West was like. It was a, it was a cold a, and a hot and a and a hard life, and life was short. It, it's not. And Will Penny captures that in his fifteen minutes. Well, the rest of the movie is more melodramatic. But it still has a lot of feeling to it. I mean, it's a, and, and, and in some ways, it's a lot like Kirk Douglas's film, Lonely or the Brave. Lonely or the Brave. Characters have a lot in common. Um, and the purpose of the, of the stories have a lot in common. And Lonely or the Brave is a, is a contemporary Western, whereas Will Penny is, is a traditional old John, West Western. John, have you seen Will Penny? I'm afraid not. Well, but you and I, you and I uh, share that. We are both probably due to watch Will Penny in the near future because uh, obviously it's a movie we need to see. I'm going to put up a picture of a, one of my favorites. It's another troubled production. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Ah, uh, yes, Major Dundee, yes. which is uh, here. It's, he's pictured with James Coburn playing Mr. Potts, the one-arm Mr. Potts. This is a Civil War drama. For those of you who've never heard of Major Dundee, it's about. Uh, in a little way, it has touches of the searchers. It's basically a story of how a, a cavalry union supported by Confederate prisoners uh, goes after a, a group of uh, children that have been kidnapped by a, an Apache named Sierra Chiriba, played by the Australian actor Michael Pate. Um, and uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it is an interesting movie. Uh, Heston is perfectly cast once again as a very stalwart army officer, stubborn, but looking strong in the saddle. Um, John, what, what do you remember about this movie? I, I remember that this really came out during a string of uh, 
war westerns in which uh, the shape of the American Civil War on film <clears throat> shifted after um, Gone with the Wind towards more of a unionist tradition of films such as like Shenandoah and uh, John Huston's Red Badge of Courage. And this was part of a constellation of films uh, that one scholar calls war westerns, where like some of the ideas of the Civil War that are played out in the cultural imagination are migrated into the Western genre and the Western just becomes a new setting for like a different setting for like some of these ideas to to play out and yeah major dundee was uh, among other films like the searchers uh really was part and parcel of it i never i in my imagination in my memory it is always unfortunately playing second fiddle to the searchers but uh really some great moments you know that uh, heston brings to the screen here and some levity here you know a lot of production value i mean this uh, is filmed on location in mexico uh uh but troubled um sam peckinpah did, did not get along with either the producer or the studio it's interesting the movie as it stands now begins with a with heston's unit of cavalry arriving at a massacre where a full uh, company of U.S. cavalry have been killed. And you wonder how the Apaches were able to surprise them. And apparently the original script showed that the movie should begin at, a, of all things, a Halloween party. And that they're celebrating that soldiers are getting drunk. And that's how Chiriba was able to sneak up on them and kill them all. So that was all, uh, uh, that was all cut. I also think Peckinpah had a problem with the the title song they created for the movie fallen beat side the major it's a little too upbeat for him considering the first scene in the movies they come to is a massacre but i will argue that this the score it's obviously it's daniel m Pietrov yes. is a great score and to uh i don't have no idea but universal decided to replace the song I'm sorry, Columbia decided to replace the score with a very bland non-score. And I think it completely ruined the movie. Well, no, I mean, actually, it's amphitheater. When the film was recut, when it was re-released several years ago, uh, another composer was brought in, uh, Christopher, I can't I, I have to think of his name. I can't remember. Really, um, his name shouldn't be remembered for this piece. I'm sure he's well, a very talented guy, but the yeah. score is sucky. Anyway, um, we Interesting story about the film is uh, De Heston thought that Peckinpah was a very talented man, but a very undisciplined talent. And at one point, uh, but, but at one point, there, there were retakes that needed to be made. I mean, Heston knew the film was not going to be complete the way the studio just wanted to pull the cord, pull the plug on the, on the film. And Heston offered to pay for the retakes himself, figuring that the Columbia executives wanted to stay on his good side and they'd say, "Oh, well, thanks, Chuck. Oh, we'll 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 do the retakes, but you don't have to pay." But they took him up, up and up, took him up on his offer, and he ended up doing the movie pretty much for nothing. Um, but he also said that later on that what Peck and Paul was after he finally achieved with the Wild Bunch, that this film was kind of a prototype. It, you know, it, it, it was an unsuccessful attempt at something that he finally figured out how to do with the Wild Bunch. Right, right. Of course, of course. Well, gentlemen, I know that we could go another hour. Uh, we probably are due for a part two because we've missed quite a few titles. But I think this has been a good discussion. Uh, we have you've been listening to and watching Saturday Night at the Movies uh, with John Trafton and Avi Hearn and myself. I'm your host, Steve Rubin, our producers, Ben Shrewsbury. And those of you who uh, are interested in the podcast, I have a second podcast I would like to promote this week. It's called Tales from Hollywood Land. I, I do this with producer Arthur Friedman and producer Julian Schlossberg. It's a fun overview of Hollywood, the theater, television, and all sorts of other pop cultural subjects, including music. So definitely try to tune into Tales from Hollywood Land. This uh, podcast is called Stephen J. Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movies. And I certainly thank you for listening and watching today. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me for this great tribute to a great actor. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity.
Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve. Thank you, guys.